Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Maybe it's uh, nicer to be inside than outside today, right? <laughs> um, the uh, topic today is uh, the need for evaluation of language assessments. And I'll start right away. The sub-theme of the topic is uh, fairness and justice in language assessment. So let me start right away with the story. Philippa Foote introduced the world to the trolley problem. And here's the first story. Imagine a trolley is hurtling down a track after its brakes have failed. Down the track, there are five workers who are unable to leave the track. The trolley is headed towards them and going to run over all five of them. But you're a bystander and you're near a switch that can steer the trolley onto a side track. On the side track, there's one worker. If you steer the trolley onto the side track, one worker would die, but five workers on the main track would be saved. What ought you to do? Steer the trolley onto the side track and cause the death of one worker, or do nothing, even though this would mean that five workers would die. All right, any show of hands? Would you steer the, uh, the trolley onto the side track and kill one person? How many would think that way? Okay. How about uh, just doing nothing and allowing five persons to die? Oh, there are a few. Okay. So let me ask those in the majority who were going to uh, steer the, the, the trolley car, uh, what's your reasoning behind that? Yes? Somebody? Go ahead. Five versus one. Okay, so you want to prevent five people from dying, and you don't mind uh, one person dying. Okay? All right. Any other thinking? Any other reasoning? What about the, the, the people on the other side who didn't want to do anything? and you were going to allow the five people to die because you don't want to be part of the action. What do you say? Depends on agency. Okay. Well, you can shout, okay. But we have no evidence that that would help. Okay. So, there are a few who wouldn't, won't do anything, there are a few who would do something, and for the rest of you, this is like too much of a problem early in the morning. Okay, here it is, for you to keep thinking about it visually. Okay, there are the five workers, and there, there's you, and there's the, the lever, and there's a the trolley car, the one worker. Okay. Now, let's go to another problem. <clears throat> Imagine you're standing near a fat man on a bridge above the trolley track. The trolley is once again hurtling down the track and is going to kill five workers. But if you push the fat man over the bridge onto the track, it will certainly stop the track and save the five workers, but will cause the death of the fat man. What ought you to do? Okay. Would you push the fat man over the bridge and onto the trolley's track so that you can save the five workers? Although this would cause the death of, of the fat man? Or do nothing, even though this would mean that five workers would die? Any show of hands? For the uh, pushing the fat man over the bridge? Anyone? One? <laughs> Only one person? Two? Three? Three. Okay, what about the rest of you? You're not going to push the fat man? Five people are going to die. So what happened to the principle we uh, sort of felt was 
being used in the first story of 5 verses 1. It's also 5 verses 1 here, right? So why is this problematic for you? It's a pushing. Okay. Why is he fat? Why is it a man? Why couldn't it be a cow? Well, vegetarians would object. Well, okay. Um, so, you imagine you're standing next to this person who's fat, and he's leaning over, and you can push him, and the, the trolley car would stop. Now, one of the objections was that you don't want to push the person, because then it looks as though you are actively doing something. What if there was a, a sort of steering wheel that just dropped him onto the track? Is that okay? What if it, you accidentally tripped on a lever that opened a, a trap door? Would that make it better? So what is the principle here, uh, once again? Is it five versus one? Or is it different somehow? Because of your need to be involved? actively involved in pushing the fat man? Okay. Okay, here it is. <clears throat> you can remember this for the day and wonder what you ought to do. Okay. That's an interesting, well, we, I, I'll talk about some variations later. Okay, let's take another situation. Imagine you're a transplant surgeon and you're in a hospital and uh, let's get to it. Okay, the third scenario. Imagine you're a transplant surgeon in a hospital who has five patients, each in need of a vital organ. They will die without the transplants, but no organs are available. But just then a healthy person walks into the hospital for a routine checkup. When the doctor does the checkup, she discovers that the patient's organs are compatible with all five of his dying patients. What ought you to do? Would you take the vital organs from the healthy person and conduct the organ transplant surgeries, thus saving five patients, although the healthy person would die? Who thinks that the, the, the surgeon should do this? Take the organs from the healthy person. Anyone? No one? Why is this objectionable? Why do you feel that this is it? Isn't it a case of five versus one? Hippocratic oath, okay. Don't do any harm. Okay, but what if the doctor doesn't... Imagine that oath to be enforced, but, you know, has these five dying patients and one healthy person right in front of her, and she has to do something to save. I mean, isn't there an obligation to save as well? You might be committing murder. What, what philosophical principle would you invoke? Yes. Sorry, we, I don't think we could hear that. It's not worth killing a bunch of people to save one. Okay, all right. So there's a different line of reasoning there that you ought to find an alternative solution to this problem and not to 
look for either allowing the five people to die or killing one person to save the five people. So, now that we've seen these three scenarios, how do we make decisions and, and morally justify them? Three possible principles are, in, are working here. One is killing fewer than a greater number. Principle one. Principle two is permitting harm when you think it's appropriate. And three is avoiding harm. So the first principle, killing fewer than a greater number, is often invoked, is often used. And in this case, in the first story, in the first scenario, some of you felt that it's all right to do that. In the, in the other scenarios, uh, for example, permitting harm, a few of you thought that you could push the fat man over the bridge. In the third scenario, clearly, you want to avoid harm. Uh, a doctor is not meant to harm people. Let's move forward. Now, using that as a backdrop, I'd like you to now consider some unfair language assessments. And I'll come back to some of the trolley problem-like problems that we've had in the world. One of them is the Philip Morrison case uh, of uh, a study of smoking in the Czech Republic. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. I'll, I'll talk about that briefly. Also, the Ford Pinto case in the US. You know about that? OK, I'll come back to these. But for now, let's start looking at language assessment. After all, you're here to, to think about language assessment. Here is a literacy test in Alabama in the, 19, in the 1860s that was given to white applicants and black applicants who wanted to vote in, the, in local elections. And uh, this is a, an actual example uh, from a of a test. Um, the, the first line there, the white applicants were given that line to read. They had to read section 20, that no person shall be imprisoned for debt. That was the line. And black ap applicants were given this paragraph. So you know um, what the intention was. Okay. I don't have to say more about this. Here's a literacy test for voting rights in Louisiana, 1860s also. Draw a line under the last word in this line. Cross out the longest word in this line. Draw a line around the shortest word in this line. Draw a line through the letter that comes earliest in the alphabet. Spell backwards, forwards. <laughs> Print the word vote upside down, but in the correct order. <coughs> Print a word that looks the same, whether it's printed forwards or backwards. And this is an example of a literacy test to find out whether you can read or write uh, in English in the 1860s to allow people to vote. Now, how many of you would think that this is meaningful in terms of a literacy test. So once again, the intention of this test is clear. Let's look at a literacy test for immigration in the United States. <clears throat> literacy tests in the 1920s and 30s required uh, immigrants to read from a card uh, in the language of the immigrant. Uh, so Italian immigrants were expected to read aloud either the Italian or the English text to the immigration inspector. Uh, and there were many cards with dual language cards. And according to Martin, immigration inspectors under the direction of the Secretary of Labor were to use uniform pieces of paper, each with no fewer than 30, not more than 40 commonly used words, printed in plainly legible type to test the immigrants. Here's, the, here's a card which has Italian on top and has English at the bottom. 
Now, if you don't read Italian, you read the English. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. That's the line for an immigration inspector to understand. I don't know if the immigration inspector would understand this, but an immigrant had to read this and uh, had to show that he or she could read this text reasonably well to be allowed into the country. And this affected, obviously, most Italians and Southern Europeans who were uh, immigrating to the United States in the 1920s and 30s. And certainly this legislation, which uh, deployed this kind of testing, was uh, designed to stem the flow of immigrants from, the, from Southern Europe. Here's Australia's white Australia policy. The Immigration Restriction Act of 1901 implemented a race and color-based approach through what is Australia's most infamous language policy. Section 3A of the Act prohibited the immigrant of any person who, when asked to do so by an officer, fails to write out at dictation and sign in the presence of an officer a passage of 50 words in length in an European language directed by the officer. The dictation test was used as a way to enforce Australia's immigration policy. Such people were administered a dictation test in the language they did not speak. If they knew the language of the first dictation, they were given another dictation in another language, and so on, until they failed. Yeah, here's uh, the dictation test until 1958. These are paragraphs in English. Um, typically, uh, we know from records, uh, Australian immigration records, that if you were an undesirable immigrant, when you arrived on the shores, of Australia, you'd be given a, a dictation in, say, G uh, French. And if you could do that dictation French, you were given, say, Italian. If you did that, you were given, say, uh, Swedish. And if you did that, then you were given Gaelic. And most of the time, people failed, because who, who could read Gaelic? So there are countless uh, examples of how people failed um, the dictation process uh, in Australia. And that effectively ruled out uh, most uh, people from uh, Eastern Europe and uh, people from uh, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and so forth. But once again, this was uh, government policy. So, <clears throat> I've finished two parts of this talk. The first is the trolley problem and other problems. Second are examples of unfairness. I'm trying to build a case for the need for evaluation of tests. Now, none of these tests had any evaluative process. There was government policy. It was interpreted by government officials or uh, their agents in terms of designing a test, designing a process. And uh, there was no check to see if the process, in fact, uh, was meaningful, was beneficial. Uh, to the community or to society or to the country. In fact, in most cases, it was detrimental, deliberately detrimental. It was designed to be detrimental. Okay. So now I'd like to come to some contemporary kinds of scenarios and see what you think. Okay, imagine you have recently joined a language testing agency that develops assessments for high-stakes contexts. After you've worked there for three months, you begin to be concerned about the agency's practices. First, they did not pretest their test tasks. Instead, they used the non-pretest tasks in an administration and did not delete the scores from those tasks when they were computed, or when they computed the scores for the test takers. So test takers received scores that included tasks that were not pretested. You approach your supervisor, who's the head of assessment development. He says that pretesting tasks would cost too much money for the organization. And if they conducted a pretest, the assessment would also cost the test taker much more time. Is it a case of permissible harm? Is it justifiable? So, how many of you think this is okay? Not to have a pretest before the administration.
is it all right to, uh, I mean, in some sense, there could be some harm to people who were physical harm. Yes. This is not harm in a physical way, but it could be harmful to the individual if he or she is placed at a lower level or a higher level or, or not admitted to a program, not given a scholarship, whatever the benefits of doing well on this test are. So you have a test designer or a test agency or a ministry of education, say, that designs the test, no pre-testing, they administer the test, they um, score the performance, and they make decisions. Is that okay? That's the question. Well, unfortunately, most agencies around the world don't do much pre-testing. That's the reality. And that's why I have this scenario. And everywhere I talk about this, people say, pre-testing, what is that? Okay. So they assume that if they gather five or 10 English language teachers who are, say, experienced or senior, they will come up with a test that's appropriate and that's it. There needs to be no further uh, evaluation before the test is launched. Here's another one. Imagine you also found that the testing agency did not conduct any review to examine whether the assessment was fair to all test takers in terms of content or the dialect or the test delivery or the test performance. You bring this matter up with the supervisor. Uh, the supervisor said that while these are important matters, the organization did not have staff with expertise to conduct such investigations. The supervisor also reminded him that these reviews would cost the agency a lot of money. And the final result would be that the, the assessment would cost the test taker more. Is it a case of positive duty or negative duty? Is it justifiable? Is it all right to have a test, in short, is it all right to have a test which could be biased against uh, any group of people? In, in the past, most tests were biased against women at least in the United States. Uh, most tests were biased against uh, minorities, African Americans. These uh, kinds of, uh, you know, biases have now been rectified in most language assessments, at least in the United States, because of uh, litigation possibilities. Now, the question is, do we allow it in our own contexts? Uh, when we design a test, do we check? for bias. Do we check to see if the test is biased in favor or against any group that's taking the test? If not, should we be doing this? Or should we be always, always be reminded about the cost? Okay, okay let me st stop here for a moment and talk about cost. One of the ways a philosophical approach to reasoning is called utilitarianism. The idea of utility, focusing on utility. Well-known uh, thinkers in this area, Jeremy Bentham, 18th century philosopher from the UK, from England, and, uh, and further on, later on, John Stuart Mill. Uh, their argument was the most important thing was utility, and we need to focus on utility as the way to measure anything. And the way you look at utility is you can look at what matters to us as, as human beings. What matters to us is pain or, and pleasure. So increase pleasure or increase happiness and minimize pain. And one way to look at everything is through the prism of utility or utilitarianism, as it was called. And one branch of that is consequentialism. To think of consequences of a test. And one approach to consequential thinking is what we popularly know, know as risk-benefit analysis or cost-benefit analysis. So everything can be boiled down to cost-benefit analysis. Here's one example of cost-benefit analysis. The previous scenario was also cost-benefit analysis. No pre-testing, but that's okay because if you wanted to do it, it costs more. No uh, checks for bias, well, if you, but if you want to do it, it'll cost more. 
I'll come back now to the two examples I gave you before, the uh, Philip Morrison case. Philip Morrison, as you know, is a well-known tobacco company from the United States. They did, they did research, they did a study on smoking in the Czech Republic. And they examined the cost and the benefits or the uh, doing a cost-benefit analysis, what it would cost them to actually have a campaign to stop smoking in the Czech Republic. And they found it would cost something like $140 million. And they did uh, an analysis on the other side of the ledger, and they uh, calculated uh, savings. Um, more people die earlier than otherwise. Uh, there's less pension, there's less uh, housing, there's less medical matters to deal with, and the expense would only be about $40 million. So there, in their analysis, it was cheaper to allow people to smoke and to continue uh, the campaign for smoking rather than to uh, start a campaign for no smoking because it would be more expensive. So this is a cost-benefit analysis. What do you say to that? Is this the way to think about it? Is this a way to reason? No? What, why is it problematic? Stop selling cigarettes. Okay, I mean, you know, but this was their study. This was Philip Morrison's study. And they had data about uh, uh, people who had died due to smoking-related diseases. And they uh, estimated that it would cost more to stop smoking than to allow people to smoke. Now, you might say they didn't put a dollar figure on human lives. So what does a human life cost? What is it? I mean, we know that actuarial, you know, life insurance people do this. But uh, what about uh, Philip Morrison? Should have done it? Should they have done it? Estimated how much it would cost for one for every person who dies. I mean, does it? Is there a dollar value that we can associate with the person's death to the family or to in terms of lost earnings or you know, future earnings, that sort of thing? Well, this is what Ford Pinto did with the Ford Pinto case. Ford, the, the Pinto car was a small car, but it had a sort of fatal flaw. The engine was in the back. And uh, every time it was, uh, the, uh, Pinto cars were involved in collisions, the, there would be uh, a fire and many people died and many people were injured. So Ford Pinto did a study and they actually found that yes, people are dying this way, but you know, we can estimate that if we have to change all the 1.5 million cars in the country, it would cost a certain amount. And they estimated that 2,000 people had died, and if you put that 2,000 times 200,000, the value of a, a human being, according to them, that was not very much. So it was all right if people died because, you know, at 200,000 per person, uh, it was cheaper for them not to do anything with the car uh, than to actually fix the car because fixing the car was way too expensive. What do you think about this? Well, both companies were horrified that these documents came out into the open. And Philip Morrison uh, uh, sent out uh, apologies, and took out uh, pages in newspapers, uh, you know, apologizing. Uh, Ford Pinto was admonished and, you know, was uh, under prosecution and so forth. So uh, in both cases, both uh, corporate agencies were found uh, to be heartless, if you like to call it that morally bankrupt, you know, people use such terms because they did not take into consideration um, 
people and their aspirations and their goals and, you know, the, the people surrounding them, family members and so forth. Uh, this is what could be happening when our tests are administered without appropriate evaluation. They are more silent. They're not as obvious as the Philip Morrison case. Not even as obvious, of course, as the Ford Pinto case. In both these contexts, you can see that harm is done quite obviously. But when a test is designed and poorly designed and poorly administered, poorly scored, and decisions are, are made based on a poorly designed and administered test, uh, the, the harm done to individuals may not be noticeable, but it's there because there's a person who did not get admission to a university, person who didn't get the scholarship, didn't get a job, didn't get to immigrate, uh, didn't get into the right courses, into the right program. So all of these things are going on, but in a more silent sort of way. Well, let me continue. Okay, imagine you wrote a test for your undergraduate class. As a conscientious instructor, you showed your test to a colleague. Your colleague pointed out that 10 items out of 50 needed revision but you decided to go ahead and administer the test without revision. You reason this way. In order to revise the items, I would have to spend another two hours. Further to change or revise the graphs and charts would cost some money. Only 20% of the items were defective. Only 10 students out of 60 would lose a few points. I would not make a difference to the ranking of the students. Permissible harm? Justifiable? Anyone thinks this is all right? Your reasoning uh, number one, your first reason, you'd have to spend more time. You don't want to spend any more time than you've already spent. Or only 20% of the items were defective. Only 10 students would be affected. Would make a difference to the rankings. Sometimes these thoughts and these uh, things may come in the way of uh, a proper design, a proper administration, a proper scoring, because, uh, you know, some practical matters may come in. And perhaps we may think that this is a case of permissible harm. Here's another one. Imagine you designed and wrote a final assignment for your class. You, sh you should provided a short article titled, Is Bali Overtaken by Too Much Tourism? Students would expect you to read the article and then write an essay, taking the position on the topic. You read the essays and give grades to all. The next day, you read, read the essays and gave new grades. When you compared the grades, you found there were differences. A-grade students in the first list, but not A-grade students in the second list. But you went ahead and submitted the second list to the college. Case of permissible harm. All right. What ought you to do? What would you do? You were too liberal or too severe? Double marking? Yeah, by yourself. That is inter, intra rate of reliability. So what ought you to do? Give the first list, give the second list, or is there another alternative? Somebody else to mark uh, the essays again? Test selection. Imagine you were asked to select out of three tests. Test A was developed by a well-established company known for its quality products. Test was traditional, was broadly suitable in terms of content, it was normed for the national population, and it cost $500 for a class of 40. Test B developed by a small local company, highly suitable for, in terms of content, normed for the local population, and checked for fairness. It was proven to offer accurate results and useful in diagnostic information and it cost $800 for a class of 40. Test C was an innovative test developed by teachers from another local school. It had not been analyzed yet, but was, avail but was available for free for the class. Which of these tests would you choose and why? Would you take a utilitarian approach and say, test C, it's cheap, no cost.
Or would you choose uh, test B? What principle? What principle would you use in making a decision? Is it only cost? Is it just cost benefit analysis? There are some people at any university who only look at cost. And you know who they are, you know. Um, so this kind of dilemma is probably something you've faced. The question is, how do you reason uh, with your decision? One of the key matters I've been promoting in my talks in the last year or so is the public reasoning. We think that any tests should be reasoned publicly through forums, conferences, papers, discussions, so that the test takers, parents, community leaders, uh, university officials are satisfied with the quality of the assessment. So here's another scenario. Imagine parents of a school who received low grades protested against the MOE's approach and demanded that they provide a public justification of the assessment. The MOE replied with the firm, no, as it had never responded to such a request before and did not consider it necessary to do so. Test takers were denied basic freedoms, such as the basic right to be treated with respect and dignity, to, a fair, to have fair assessments and assessment practice, and to have redress in terms of rescoring or reevaluation or even legal redress. Uh, was the assessment fair? Was the institution just? Now, this is an actual example from a, a country where I worked for about four years, and this would happen almost every year, and the Ministry of Education just said, no, we are not going to discuss the test. You know, you can complain that it was too difficult, it was too easy, it was whatever it is, the scoring wasn't done well. And they would not have any discussion about the test. They said it's all confidential and parents can protest and principals can protest, teachers can protest. We are very, very good at what we do. We're professional. We don't have to be accountable to anyone. So how would you respond as a test taker, as a parent, as a community member, if, if this is the way uh, assessments are used in our society. So should there be some form of public consultation, public reasoning, public justification? Okay. And now comes uh, the, the concept of differential pricing. You're always, uh, you're all familiar with differential pricing. You sit in an airplane and you've paid $500 for your seat to go someplace. Your neighbor uh, has paid uh, 300 or 800 and uh, that's the way it goes. You buy your ticket on a particular day, somebody else buys a ticket on a different day, they get a different price. Um, in um, California, high occupancy vehicle lanes are now available to people who do not have more than one passenger well, just, just themselves, and uh, they can pay a fee and get on that lane. Okay? They were pr primarily meant for HOV lanes, which meant that you had at least two people in the car. But if you have some extra money in your pocket, you can buy uh, a card and uh, get on that lane. Or, or you can uh, upgrade your prison cell in Santa Barbara. Uh, yeah, you, you get thrown in jail for, say, speeding or... Uh, DUI, driving under the influence, uh, you get uh, thrown in there for three days or whatever and you can uh, uh, get a luxury suite. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Uh, you, you, you'll probably say, oh, that's California. Well, it's coming, don't worry. <laughs> it's coming to your neighborhood. <laughs> Imagine you received a questionnaire from a well-known assessment developer and publisher who's planning on introducing differential pricing for various services related to testing. Uh, the proposal is higher test taker fees for new services. There'd be two levels of pricing, regular and premium. Okay, which of these would you find suitable or acceptable? Here we go. So here's a test which has thorough validity, reliability, and fairness studies. 
Do you think it should belong to the regular pricing or premium pricing? Regular pricing. Okay. What about individual diagnostic feedback instead of generic feedback? Premium? Okay. What about experienced raters? Regular? Well, what about unexperienced raters or inexperienced raters? Oh. Faster turnaround time. Premium, okay. Front row seating for large group listening tests. Now this may be a joke, but you know, in the old fashioned way, you had speakers in front for listening, and not, not surround and not on a computer, but you know, right in front. People who sat in front could hear the listening input very clearly. People who sat in the back may or may not have heard the input very clearly. So would you be in favor of uh, front row seating? Costing more? I mean, we have this, right, in, in, in many contexts. You want to sit in the front row, like uh, you want to go and watch a Madonna concert or Kendrick Lamar or whatever, you front row, you pay more. So listening tests could be the same. What about better room facilities, air conditioning and heating, regular pricing? What about assistance from grammar and spell checks in writing? Regular pricing or premium pricing? You don't want to have it, but suppose I'm willing to pay more. How much more? Okay. <laughs> what about a color monitor, large monitors? Accommodations for test takers with disability. Yeah? There are people who've been toying with the idea of, uh, you know, charging people for accommodations because it costs more to develop a, a you know a, a test with some accommodations. Extended time means more time in the in the room, more time for proctors. If they have different kinds of uh, accommodations, um, you know they require services of additional people and so on. So there's a feeling that people with accommodations, people who want accommodations, should pay more. What about human raters and automated? machine rating for writing, say. I mean, typically we're used to the idea of human raters, right? Teachers rate or raters uh, who are employed by a testing agency rate essays, rate speeches. Um, but there's also a move now to have automated scoring with the help of computers. Uh, there are at least three or four companies that have software that can do that. So would you be willing to pay more for human raters? Because slowly, I think our jobs are going to be phased out as raters. Uh, not entirely, but maybe, at least for certain kinds of tasks. So there will come a time when we will become too expensive. And automated scoring would be, once you purchase the product and you've got the algorithm set for those particular essays, you don't have to do much. So this is also something to think about. Uh, you know, at a very practical level. So, just to cycle back to the way we've been looking at tests and evaluation of tests. One way is to look at standards. Standards set by different groups of people. Another way is to use an argument-based approach. And a third way is the way I'm proposing, an ethics-based approach. So let me give you some ideas here about standard-based. Some of you are probably familiar with all of these. Uh, the APA, the American Psychological Association, American Education Research Association, and the National Council for Measurement in Education. They have standards uh, routinely revised every 10 years. ILTA, the International Language Testing Association, has guidelines, codes of, pra codes of, uh, codes of, code of ethics, and a guidelines for practice. Cambridge Language Assessment has its VRIP, Validity, reliability, impact, and practicality. They also have a document called Striving for Fairness. Uh, ALTE, the Association of Language Testers of Europe, they have 17 minimum, minimum quality standards, and they have what is called a QMAR. They award to um, uh, you know all tests that have passed certain standards. It, it's not funny. I mean, it's it's real. It's not like the 10, 14 gun salute and the 21 gun salute which the British government always gave its, uh, the, the, the Rajas in India. Uh, ETS also has uh, uh, standards for quality 
and fairness. And you'll see the application of all of these standards in many journals, uh, language testing, language assessment quarterly, and the mental measurement yearbook that comes out every four years. Another approach is uh, argument-based approach, and you'll see some of these uh, in the literature. Uh, Toulmin's uh, model is the one widely used by Kane and Bachman and Palmer. You'll see some applications. And the one that I'm proposing is an ethics-based approach, which I did not talk about first. I wanted to introduce the trolley problems first and the other scenarios first, rather than uh, you know, boring you with uh, philosophical theories early in the morning. But of course, uh, the, the most important uh, uh, philosophical perspectives here are the utilitarian or outcome-based perspective or outcome-based view proposed by Bentham and Mill, and the deontological or duty-based by Immanuel Kant, and John Rawls, and Amartya Sen. In, and I'm in the second camp, as you can imagine, because I believe that as test designers, test agencies, we have an obligation, duty to do certain things properly and not always look at the bottom line, look at revenue, look at uh, cost benefit, uh, look at how many test takers have taken the test and how many dollars we've collected. And I've designed two principles, a principle of fairness and a principle of, a principle of justice, uh, basically talking about different aspects of how you can investigate a test in terms of uh, these principles. Uh, we talk about, in the first one, in the first sub-principle, we talk about what is called opportunity to learn, OTL. Opportunity, here, opportunity to acquire knowledge, ability, ability skills. Uh, and here, consistency and meaningfulness. So consistency is reliability, meaningfulness is validity. Uh, free of bias, absence of bias. Uh, appropriate access, which includes accommodations, administration and standard, standard setting, so that decision making is equitable. And uh, a principle of justice, which focuses on uh, how institutions ought to be just, uh, bring about benefits in society, promote positive values and advance justice through public reasoning. Um, I believe that any assessment in any assessment institution should only be in business to bring about beneficial consequences uh, to the community. Otherwise, we don't need to have a test. <clears throat> and uh, I also promote the idea that we should uh, advance justice, not just identify cases of unfairness. Um, so here's a diagram diagrammatic approach to uh, how this can be done. So if you develop your ethics-based principles, this can lead to what we generally call claims. Thank you. Uh, claims are what every test designer or every test makes implicitly or explicitly. That is, we say, my test is valid, my test is reliable, my test is fair, my test has beneficial consequences, and my test has uh, appropriate accommodations for people with disability and so forth. So in, in many cases, it's implicit. It's not explicitly stated but it could be explicitly stated as well. And we have uh, warrants or types of evidence that need to be collected to f figure out whether these uh, claims can be supported or the claims can, can be dismissed. Sometimes we have to use qualifiers because we say, yeah, presumably, maybe, maybe not. We can also have a counterclaim. We can say no. This test is not valid, this test is not reliable, this test is not fair. Like some of the unfair practices, if you put them through this sort of uh, diagrammatic machine, you'll clearly show that the literacy tests, the voting tests, uh, the dictation tests, the immigration tests are clearly, uh, you know, not fair. And you need the backing and evidence. Let me give you an example of this. So I studied, uh, I examined the U.S naturalization test. This is the test for immigration. Oh, sorry, not the test for immigration. It's a test for citizenship uh, in the United States. If you've um, already immigrated and if you've lived in the United States for seven years, you can, uh, five years, you can be naturalized. But in order to be a naturalized citizen, you have to take uh, two tests, a test of English and a test of history and civics or a history and government. And I'm focusing on the English part. So the claim is that the test is beneficial, 
Um, the, and this is what you need to collect. You need to collect data on meaningfulness in terms of the constructs, consistency in the administration, and that it's beneficial. Okay, so I look for data, and uh, what I found is that there's a very high pass rate, about 92%, except uh, in the 50 plus age range. Um, and the test developers view that the United States uh, Citizenship Office, they say it's a useful way to learn about the US and it should not be evaluated like a standardized test. The, one of the claims that uh, the test makes is that it'll bring about civic nationalism. And we found that the test has no impact on civic nationalism. Study done by Min shows that uh, Korean uh, immigrants who were living in Los Angeles, who took the test and passed the test, did not change their behavior before or after in terms of civic nationalism. They were, if they were, you know, if they went to a senior citizen center and played mahjong or or, or sang karaoke K-pop songs, they did that later. But they did, they didn't do it before. They didn't do it after. Uh, Martinez found that uh, Hispanic Americans who are eligible to apply for citizenship did not apply. In large numbers, 68 percent, because they felt that the test would be too much for them to deal with, the test of English. So they just didn't apply. So once again, it was not really beneficial. Um, there were test takers views that the, the test, there was a lot of memory related stuff. Uh, the content had variable items. So, as you know, the listening, speaking, reading, writing items for the test is done by the immigration officer. And the immigration officer, in the case of uh, dictation, could ask you write, to write down, today is a beautiful day. And if you wrote that down correctly, you passed the written part. Okay? But it could be um, it, uh, the American president lives in Washington, D.C. So it could be a sentence like that, or it could be, today's a beautiful day. I've, I've recorded many sentences, uh, you know, uh, from different immigration offices in California and Hawaii and others. There's a lot of variation. So the question is, what does an immigrant get in terms of a question? And then there's no due process at all because you cannot challenge the test in court. It's, it's outside the jurisdiction of a court. So unlike um, many other tests in the United States which can be challenged, immigration tests cannot be challenged. And this is uh, an anomaly in the uh, legal system in the US. So I would say, well, you know, the claim is not sure that the claim can be supported possible that the claim uh, could be rebutted. And I have another example. I won't go through this. This is an example of a test uh, in California. We found that uh, the test is not really free of bias. It's an ESL placement exam at UCLA. Uh, I did a study of that. And uh, we found the test is biased against uh, Chinese and uh, Vietnamese uh, test takers. And the test favors Spanish uh, first language test takers. It's also partly to do with cognates, but also not to do with cognates. So I claim that it's not fair. All right, so irrespective of who develops an assessment, you have to ask some fundamental questions. Is the assessment beneficial to the community? Is our ethical thinking duty-based and not totally outcome-based or totally utilitarian? I understand the push, I mean the pull from utilitarians, the pull from uh, directors of programs, uh, managers, uh, you know, deans and so forth who always uh, have the bottom line, the dollar figure, how much are you spending on this and how many people do you have on this project, can we reduce that number? That's always, uh, you know, at the back of uh, our minds as project, uh, you know, officers. Is that a place for permissible harm? So we could use what's available to us, standards, codes of practice, hopefully universal ones, not parochial ones like you know some people say, this is how we do it. We don't care how it's done everywhere else. Um, and uh, preferably use ethical thinking 
uh, which is duty based and not totally outcome based. And all of this, uh, shamefully, some advertising here, is uh, from my recent book. Thank you very much. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, you're saying what I would have said. Uh, but the, the bottom line is, in my view, um, it's not uh, about money. It's about a way of thinking in terms of all of us teachers as test designers and test users in our classrooms. Uh, we don't have to spend a whole lot of money to design a test. Most of us do it uh, on a regular basis. But do we do some checks in terms of meaningfulness of the test, in terms of fairness of the test? Do we do a pretest? Do we ensure that the test is reliable, that the scoring of your essays in the morning and if you score it in the afternoon, if you're getting different results for your students, is, you know, is there something wrong? So we can do a lot of things ourselves without uh, uh, involving a whole lot of money. Now, <clears throat> agencies that are larger and uh, that have high stakes tests, standardized tests, which are administered nationwide or worldwide, uh, the obligations uh, that they ought to have are definitely higher, if you like, or wider. Uh, they need to have expertise among them, their own staff, to be able to do all of these things. Uh, and they cannot simply say, well, you know, we don't have the money, uh, because they are profit-making institutions. Even the not-so-profit-making institutions make a profit. You know, ETS is a good example. It's a not-for-profit institution, but it's not for loss either, you see. So um, there are these agencies that do make a lot of money, and some of them are well-staffed, who, who, who are capable of doing a lot of research in all of these areas. But there are countless testing agencies around the world um, that don't have staff of any quality. Uh, and this is because, unlike in many other fields, in many other uh, product-oriented industries, we, have re we don't have any regulatory body uh, in any, anywhere in the world. We have some groups like the Alte Group, which monitors the tests of French and German and Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, etc., on a voluntary basis. Uh, we have Ofqual in the UK, which sort of monitors some of the school level and college level exams. In the United States, there are no controls, no uh, uh, regulatory bodies. So it is a self, uh, so language testing is a self-regulating sort of industry. So it's left to every test developer, any test developer, to have systems in place. Um, uh, there are, if you look at the mental measurement yearbook, which comes out every so often, you'll find about 150 tests, some tests developed in garages by two people. And they uh, make claims and there are people who buy the tests. So 
is there an obligation? Is there a, should there be any regulation? Should there be some oversight body? These are matters that we would like to, I mean, I, I've written about all of these in the book. Uh, I think, I'm not saying we should have a regulatory body, but we should have some system by which we can have uh, an understanding of the quality of these assessments. We understand there's a difference between, um, you know, uh, a basic Ford model car and a Mercedes Benz or a BMW. We know that. We know that uh, features can be uh, at, a, at a different level for different price ranges. Taking cars, for example, uh, as a way of looking at it. So tests too can have uh, not just about differential pricing, but you know even other kinds of things. You can have paper-based tests. You can have computer delivered test, you can have computer adaptive test, you can have computer simulated tests, I and mean, all kinds of possibilities exist depending on how much money you have in the bank for that kind of product. But ethicality, ethical way of thinking is essential in all of this. Thank you. For